perimeter with a minute 15 left on this five minute major. Puck put in front, quap the save, rebound loose. Back oh down, my goodness. Scores, and he shot that one between his legs, did Mitch Kopp. Hat trick. Watch this here, folks. This is unbelievable. Matvey Mitchkov with the incredibly quick hands. Nice puck work around by the Russians as number 17. Keep your eyes on him here. The puck pops out. It's rolling on him as it comes out here. And he is going to just put it right between his legs. It's Isaiah, just reminding you that FlyersNittyGritty.com and the OMB Podcast are brought to you by Summit Public Adjusters. Hey, do you have damage to your home? Not sure who to call? We suggest that you call Summit Public Adjusters before your insurance company. Dealing with your insurance company can be very stressful. Let Summit take the stress out of the claims process. From storm damage to your roof, to toilet overflows, to broken pipes and fires, Summit gets you the most money for your repairs. So next time Mother Nature leaves you in need of repairs, call Summit Public Adjusters at 215-752-0560 or visit SummitPublicAdjusters.com. Licensed in PA and New Jersey. And we are back. It is Isaiah. Yeah, it's been a while. (laughs) Welcome to the OMB Podcast, episode number 227. Matt V. Mishkoff has landed. Yeah, we're brought to you by FlyersNittyGritty.com and Jim South Street. We'll get to Jim's later. But the the big story today right now is Matt V. Mishkoff not only signed a deal, not only is it appearing at JFK Stadium, he was in front of the press and all the excited people uh, down at the skate zone actually talking uh, talking a little bit of English through a translator up there with Danny Briere. We'll talk about that. And then we'll get into what the Flyers have done so far this offseason. It probably represents most of what they're going to do outside of some maybe roster trimming or cap moves. Uh, but maybe not. We'll, we'll, we'll discuss that. But we, we have to get into this. So, Chef B, to my left, uh, what are your thoughts looking at Matt V. Michkov at today's presser? You know, I sat there and I watched it three times. I watched it over and I made some notes and I sat there and I'm like, incredibly, uh, even though it's through a translator, the kid just fired off answer after answer after answer. Didn't seem phased by all this. I mean, God forbid, uh, I can't wait to see when he actually meets the fan base and they come out to a practice at, at Voorhees and they're, they're like, they have to, I have to cut it, cut it at the door there because people are going to be like so fired up for this kid. And he just showed so much poise. So I'm happy about that. I, 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 his answers were pretty much what I figured they would be. I mean, he seems to know all the rules, but the best thing about it is when they asked him about the Phillies, that was awesome. I, I, I think, I think I want this kid around Bryce Harper and, and that whole team as soon as I can, because I want that infectious thing. He, he knows that they're winners and he wants the flyers to be like that. So which is awesome. So I can't wait. Okay. Uh, the great Dan Silver, you know, I thought that Matt Bay looked a little bit like a little, uh, like a, a somewhat a, a miniature Ivan Drago up there. Calm, cool, and kind of deadly. I don't know if I'd compare him to Ivan Drago, but uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, it is It's so exciting. He's here. My favorite thing about the press conference was that his family's going to join him which I think is great. I think, you know, we were all worried about what after happened with his father, that, you know, people were kind of more more concerned, you know, let's get him over here, let's get his family over here. So his mom's over here, his little brother's over here. So I thought that was great. He, You could see the smile on his face when Briere was talking about how his mom and his little brother were, were going to be coming over. So I, I just thought that was terrific. And 
you know, it's, 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 he, he is, I think we've talked about this. I think Torts is just going to love him because he's such a hard worker and we'll get into a lot of this, but this kid just, you know, eats, breathes, sleeps hockey. And I think Flyer fans are just going to absolutely fall in love with him. Uh, fantastic. And joining us to discuss all of this and so much more, He's an old friend of ours, and we always love having him. He's from 97.3 ESPN in South Jersey. Kevin Durso, welcome aboard, man. Thanks, guys. Always appreciate you having me on. Great to be back. Yeah, so what what are your impressions? I, I, I know, you know, you did a piece down. I don't know if you were actually down there, but uh, it, was, uh, it, it was special in the eyes of uh, most of the fans. Yeah, no, unfortunately, I wasn't there in person. Just, you know, other work schedules, things like that just doesn't work out for my my schedule to be down there at 11 a.m. on a Wednesday morning. Yeah, no sweat. Um, but I obviously followed along. I watched the stream. I went back, obviously, to watch it to get some of the quotes into the story as well. And I'm just impressed by his poise. He just seems like a he seems like a true vet already from that standpoint. Like the media attention doesn't seem to phase him at all. And that's going to be important because he's obviously, you know, they can they can say he's not the savior per se. And I understand why they're trying to curb expectations. I said as much when I wrote about this before the presser, but I, I also understand that like, you know, he's, uh, he's everywhere right now. Since, since the news of the signing, he's been on billboards, his Jersey's been hanging up ready for sale. Everybody's you know, it's all attention on him. So if he's able to handle that and, and looks at the team that he was on in the KHL, or at least, who owned his rights. He didn't play for them last year. Obviously he played in Sochi for the most part, but still you're talking about high profile, even in a KHL. So he's used to attention and it seems like he was just prepared for anything that was going to come his way. And I think that that bodes well for all aspects of this. He's, it's going to bode well for his attention from the fan base. Cause obviously the fan base is excited. It's going to bode well for the media attention that, the flyers just get in general and it's going to bode well for him being around a coach like john tortorella and in a room that's going to have a lot of veteran presence in addition to younger talent that is going to still be more experienced than he is he, he seems like he's ready to handle all of it and that's certainly impressive from a first impression sure yeah uh dan i, I wanted to go to you um one of the things that i noticed that matt facing to talk about consistently was winning bringing a cup to Philadelphia. And I know some of that can be programmed, but like you were saying that his focus and things like this, it's almost like he's envisioned a lot of great athletes do things like this. They can, they can envision themselves succeeding because if you can do that, it's almost like you can, you know, carve a pathway in your mind and then what your actions, your motivation, it all lines up and it puts you in a, the, the right mindset to actually help accomplish those things and and it was a, a recurring theme throughout all of the interviews right but especially today so the one of my favorite ways i've heard someone describe matt bay mitchkov is that his brain is basically like a offensive supercomputer like he you know he's not the greatest skater in the world he, he's a good skater he's not the greatest skater in the world um it's not the you know greatest he he's not the greatest stick handler in the world he's a very very good stick handler he is just his mind processes things he's a, at a level that very few people can and nikita kucherov is a good cop for the way that he plays um he just he he processes things so quickly in the offensive zone and you hear briere talking about that about when he gets blue line and in that he you know he just almost always makes the right play he loves scoring goals. He can set up people too. He gets to the dirty areas, which they love talking about. You know, he will go and score goals like a Brady Kachuk or a Matthew Kachuk from, you know, right on the doorstep. Whatever it takes, he will do. I, and he, the, the, the biggest low-hanging fruit is going to be the power play. Because as we've talked about, Isaiah, at nauseum, they've had the worst power play in the league for three straight years. Well, that's not going to be the case this year because he is so good – on the power play with any time and space that, that that's going to change. Um, I do, and we can get into it. I mean, I have some concerns about, uh, I don't know how much this team is going to win this year. So my only concern is I hope that he doesn't get, you know, too frustrated or anything like that. I think he probably understands what's going on. He's come over here a, a year or two before 
the team really anticipated him coming over. But um, but just from an uh, just from what we're going to see this year, it's going to be a level like nothing we've ever seen before um, from a Flyers forward from a skill perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Shep, anything to add uh, about you know your impressions and what's been said so far? Well, uh, no, just uh, just to reiterate, I mean, he's got that winning attitude, and you love that. And I, I think you know, I'll, I'll wait to, to comment on other stuff when, when, when we talk about it. But I just like that whole fact about him. Like Kevin actually said it perfect too. The poise. I I couldn't believe this is a 19 year old kid sitting in front of me. Didn't act like a 19 year old kid. And, and we talked about you know. Uh, you know, what it was going to be like for him here, but we just realized, you know, the KHL isn't a joke. So he's he's been playing over there for a, a, a while now, and he's been exposed to all this stuff at a very early age. So I guess it shouldn't be surprising that he carries himself the way he does and so so well, actually. And you know, I, I, I think he's, you know, I, I don't have exceedingly high expectations for him this season, but I think he's going to even surprise us a little bit you know, with what he can handle and what, what, you know, like Dan said, his mind is so much faster than what we can process in, in a situation on the ice. So it's, it's going to be, we're going to sit there and go, Oh my God, you know, that one typical last year, uh, I don't expect him to make the huge difference, but I expect to see four or five different spinning goals like that. See caliber kind of goals, not exactly the way it is, but that kind of caliber goal of scoring, you know, to make us go, Oh my God. So yeah. Yep. The OMG moment. Yeah, we're looking forward to yep. that. So, Kevin, before we get into where Matt Bate fits in the lineup, whether it's, you know, who's his, who line mates are going to be, special teams, what have you, the Flyers have had a fair amount of time since the season ended. There's been an off season. They made certain draft picks. We had Scott Wheeler on. We've heard from a lot of pundits. I've read it from a lot of about, you know, a, a lot of opinions about what the Flyers did. And I wanted to get your take about maybe what you thought about how they conducted themselves on draft day, what you think their strategy is, and perhaps uh, what how that matched with your expectations. Yeah, it, it was interesting. I, I don't know that I expected them to focus as heavily on 25 as they seem to be. I was – the one thing I liked because it felt like I, I kind of had – this inkling all along when it was approaching that because the Florida pick turned out to be 32, that it was prime for a trade back scenario in some way. I was actually kind of impressed that Danny Briere went the route that he did with that trade instead of just getting back into the second round. That was where my head was at. He trades and gets another first round pick for the year after. I thought that was actually savvy on his part to go to a more, what what it appears to be anyway, and by all accounts, seems to be a more impressive draft class. I think that was a smart decision to make. And I didn't see anything wrong either when it got to 12 with moving back necessarily if you go ahead and kind of take what felt like the low-hanging fruit, so to speak. Like if you were trading back and the focus was on center at pick 12 to 13, and you took the center that everybody kind of had in mind based on the way that the board lined up and what most people thought of the board rankings, then I think everybody kind of understands your focusing on center and you added a draft pick in the process. That seems smart as well, but it's it. the end result of that pick to me came out exactly the way that 2019 did where when the flyers took cam York and they passed up Cole Caulfield twice, you're going to be, you know, jet Lashenko for better or worse. And whatever happens, he's inevitably linked to those two players from here on out. He's linked to Zeev Boyum and, to Consta Hellenius because those were the two players that were there and you're now connected to them, whether you like it or not. And that was the interesting part because it, it just felt like it was a little bit unexpected where they went with that pick. Look, Lashenko seems like a nice player. I'm not taking that away from him, but there's only so much room that people have for nice player that they got at 13 versus maybe something that was a little bit better. And that's, that's where it starts to kind of, Go, go in different directions. I, I understand why they value that 25 class. It just takes, you know, it takes this whole thing and adds a, another element with the degree of difficulty. It, it makes it a lot harder and it puts a lot more emphasis on, well, okay. Like the reference I kept making was the draft was in Vegas and Danny Breer pushed all the chips to the center of the table on 2025. This is 
you're going to have three first round picks. You're going to have three picks in the earlier part of the second round. Probably you're going to have to make it happen right then and there. Like, like the, the idea, or at least what I would envision or what I think people should be, you know, we're not should be, but the vision I think people have in their heads anyway is look at the Dallas stars, 2017 class. When you have three picks that could be in the top 40, and you end up with cornerstone players at every major position, right? Like that's, I think what people are going to have visions of because of the number of picks, you just better not screw it up. If this is what you're putting, you know, if this is you putting all the eggs in one basket, you better not screw it up. So it's, it's apparent what their strategy seems to be. It, it kind of seems like now more than ever too, it seems like this is an opportunity for Mishkov to get his feet wet in the NHL, have his rookie season play out, see what they can add with this, with these draft picks and see what happens when the money frees up too, because once the money is there and they can go into free agency with some targets as well, what do you do to put something else around this kid? Because it's obvious that, you know, regardless of whether or not you're going to call him a savior, it's obvious he's a centerpiece already because it, there, it's just being advertised that way. Your entire PR push is Matt Faye Mishkov. So that's, that's a key part of this. And now you've got to add the complimentary pieces when the time comes and, it just depends on how long that plan is going to take when you have so many draft picks and then you're going to have money too. Is is it going to be free agent heavy? Are there going to be a lot of trades to come in the years down, down the line at this, this upcoming deadline, for example, or is this going to be weighing way more on free agency and, and maybe trying to speed this thing up now that Mishkov's here. So there's a lot of questions that remain and a lot of uncertainty because you don't know the answers to these things until you get to where you actually have to do something with these picks. Yeah, uh, Chef, you want to weigh in? Uh, since you, you, you speed it, you, you mentioned speeding up the draft. There was uh, one of our listeners sat there, posed a question. His name is Rick Nellum. He said he wants to know now that he's here and he's physically here and you know he's here, does, does that make them go out and make a hockey trade this summer here uh, to bring in a little support for Mitch Goff? Or do you think, like, are they going to sit, sit, sit still and, and just let this season play out? I mean, I don't think they're going to do much of anything from here on out just because the, the, that kind of that time frame kind of has just passed by. If they were going to do something to add to it, they weren't going to be able to wait until he was physically here. They were going to have to do it based off of the KHL contracts terminated. The intention is we're going to get an NHL deal done, and it would have happened right then and there. So to me, the window to make that hockey trade was – anywhere between I'll say the Wednesday before the draft and probably the Friday after free agency. And that might be going a little late. Even it was, it was literally about one week that you had once you knew for sure that he was coming over because you really found all this out right as the Stanley cup final was ending. So you really had a small window to work with. And if it was going to happen to me, it was going to happen right then and there. And that period came and went. So I don't see it happening this off season. Yep. I got you, Dan. Yeah, I mean, I, the line from uh, Gladiator or Maximus says, the time for honoring yourself has come to an end. That's kind of like, not a you know direct correlation, but like the time for making a trade this summer, I think has sort of come come and passed. I really thought they were going to try and move Farabee for a center. Um, you know, my understanding is that they sort of ultimately decided that they weren't even sure that Trevor Zegers was going to be a center long-term at the NHL level. So they kind of lost some interest in him. I mean, I guess a guy like Marty Nachos might still be out there in trades, but I just think it's a little late for that. I had a question for Kevin going back to the draft. And, you know, we had Scott Wheeler on from The Athletic. Of course, he had Z Booham at number four in his top 100 prospect list, and Jet Lachanko wasn't even on the list, which kind of shows you what uh, the, the disparity there. Um, I'm pretty sure they would have taken Sam Dickinson if, if, if San Jose hadn't have taken him the pick before. My question is, do you think or do you have any, you know, intel that that potentially the fact that Zev Boom's agent is the same agent as Cutter Gauthier and the fact that Boom's a college player, do you think that sort of uh, scared them off of him a little bit or, um, you know, it had something to do with them passing on him? I, I don't really have intel on it, like in terms of hearing something about it in terms of, you know, but my from my own standpoint, in terms of my thoughts on it. I think the agent thing might play a little bit of a factor. I don't think the college thing really did as much because they've got other college prospects and they're not as concerned about guys like that at all. Like, like they really have, they kind of really have 
no pun intended, but they've really bumped up on Alex Bump a lot, and he's a college prospect, and it doesn't sound like they're afraid of where he's going or anything like that. So I don't think it has to do with the college angle of it at all. I think it's more just, you know, the agent tie is an interesting one. Obviously, you know, when you make that, when you make the trade that they did there, if you were that interested in, in going with the best player available and that kind of, that kind of defenseman slips, you know, you, you just do it. I don't even think you think twice. So obviously there were second thoughts there somewhere. I agree with you, Dan. I think that if Dickinson had made it, I think that was the pick because I think they've just seen enough of them. If they're already going and watching Oliver Bonk and Denver Barkey a lot, and you're talking about another one of these London Knights players, I think they would have jumped all over that in a second. And ironically enough, a team that did make a trade right before the draft hit, got up to that spot and and made the decision. And 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 that's this is what I think you hope for. And and I don't know if this is how those picks are going to line up. I mean, they would have to have a pretty terrible year to get the level, of, like obviously to get the level of picks that San Jose had. But San Jose turned in a draft that I think a lot of people like in hindsight, right? Like obviously getting the first pick is is a big deal. But when they move up from fourteen to eleven and the board falls the way that it does, now you get a defenseman too. So it's not just the center; you get a defenseman as well. So. Like that's the way that I feel like they're looking at all these picks is when you have six of them. Like, like to me, there's there's no way that these second round picks are going to be much later than 45, if at all. Like it should be top 45 because I just don't see Columbus and Anaheim doing anything of substance next year. Like maybe improved a little, but I don't see anything of substance. They're still not playoff teams to me. I just don't see that many teams that were in the playoff picture that fall that far to suddenly not you know, take them out of that picture. So your questions really become about those picks. It's where do the flyers finish? Because that will dictate two of those picks right off the bat. And then you're going to watch the playoffs really closely because I fully expect Edmonton and Colorado to be there. It's just a matter of where they all finish at the very least. You know, one of them is going to be no worse than 30th because someone's got to lose in the Western conference final. Should it be Edmonton, Colorado? And Obviously, you run the risk of having 32 again if one of them wins a Stanley Cup, but you're going to have to make the most of that. And I wonder, again, you know, I kind of thought about this a little bit with, you know, and and they didn't have a true early second round pick this year to be able to kind of play with that. But when they had two picks, you wondered if there was a chance that they said, here's insert player here who's been, you know, in trade rumors forever. Say, you know, Scott Lawton, Joel Farabee, you, you name it, any of those guys. And here's pick 32. What can we do with this? Now they've got six picks to play with. Like they got a lot of room to play with a couple of picks and see if that can't get them somewhere else. Maybe to make a trade kind of like what San Jose did to just go up a couple of spots even to see what you can put together with that. Because now you have that flexibility. It's a lot different when you only have two picks and you don't want to give up the fact that you're possibly getting two players out of that somewhere. You Now you've got six picks. You don't necessarily come away with six players because of that. You might come away with four out of that and make some trades to see if you can't improve your position on the board, depending on how everything falls. But yeah, I don't, I, I, that's, it's, it's good questions because obviously like Boyum carried a lot of attention and he's a really talented player. And I started wondering as the board fell the way that it did, look at all these defensemen. It's going to be really hard to pass up on this. The run kind of came right before they picked. So it was kind of Boyum or nothing. If you were going to go defenseman and they obviously opted to move back and get a player that they had their eye on clearly in Lashenko. So you have to hope it pans out. It's a clear swing on upside. It's a little different when, you know, I, I, I felt Oliver Bonk was a swing on upside as well, but it's a lot different when you're swinging on upside at, say, 22 after you picked what you got at seven. You know, it's not the same thing when this is your top pick of another draft that's right in the middle of a rebuild. Yeah, I think the issue that, that I have, Kev, is, is what you're pointing out there, the contrast and what they did in 23 versus this year. And it it just – it. Like you said, those two players, Hellenius and Boyum, are, are going to be looked upon like we did with uh, Cam York and Caulfield. And it's just fair or unfair. That's just the way it's going to be. I think Boyum has probably higher upside than anybody the Flyers have on their roster currently. And I that's I may be wrong. It may be, you know, and he's now he's officially six feet tall. So it's, you know, it, it's he crossed that barrier. But We'll, we'll see how that works out. I mean, for, for me, the question I have for you and the disappointment I have in this offseason is if you get, you get, you get Lachenko and you're pushing the chips, like you said, into next year, 
what have they accomplished in terms of checking off boxes for top six players going forward? And if they're pushing that down the road, maybe a year, it might end up being two years because Lechenko doesn't have the kind of puck skills you would expect for a guy who's drafted at that spot in a decent draft like this. And it makes me think, well, if they're pushing it down the road, how does that affect how many years or how much money you want to pay for Travis Konechny? Like it, it, it's all, it's all interrelated. And it's, it's like, why? Like I see teams and I've said this before and I'll, I'll say it again. People are probably tired of hearing it, but you have teams like Ottawa, Buffalo, uh, who else? Utah. They have pretty good prospect pools. Montreal. And the, yeah, but, but they're ready to win now, right? So here is like maybe we, for a change, can get our Justin Williams. We can get our Patrick Sharp by letting go a veteran who maybe doesn't fit here for whatever reason because we have a surplus and maybe getting a young center. I've talked about Yuri Coolidge from Buffalo. I, you know, he's, I asked somebody, a pundit about him, very high on him. He's a second line level talent. But what you're doing by, by making a move like that is you're complementing the timeline that you've set up by the force of, and the weight of your, your own decisions. What say you? Yeah. I, and I get where you're coming from with it because, it, because it, it, it kind of is a counter argument to something that I've thought thought about for a while because I see the way people react to this. And immediately one of my first thoughts was, is this is one of the things I've questioned about the fan base for a little while is do, you know, will you be able to deal with the timeline of a rebuild? Because now all of a sudden it was Mishkov's coming. Where's the big move, right? Like move this thing forward a little bit, but also, you know, make the right decisions with your veterans too, where it's, if you don't have a place for them, then get younger wait out the timeline on all these draft picks. If that's the way you're going to build it with, you know, upside and waiting for something to come through, then do it that way or, or go the other direction, right? Like kind of pick a side. They're trying to kind of toe that line, right? Like connect is interesting to me because of the fact that to me, I can make an argument for the, for extending him to a, for a certain number of years. Eight's going to sound daunting. I know that, but, and I can also make the argument for trading him. I get both sides of the equation. The question of whether or not you do it comes down to where you see the finish line on this timeline being when you see the window opening up for contention. If you can see that window opening up and there's reason to believe that they do in their, at least in their minds, see the window opening up in another, say, two to three years, then sure, go ahead and keep connecting me because, you know, within reason, if you don't, if you, if you don't overpay him and if you don't latch yourself on for too long, even if you have to, I guess, because we know how these contracts work. You get, sometimes you got to give to get, they did it with Nick sealer, right? Like keep the cap hit down, but give the extra year and you might not be so comfortable with it, but you may have to do it. But with Konechny, I, I don't think he's going to be ineffective. If you are saying we're ready to go in three years and, Oh, you know, the best player among the veteran core, you know, so not Mishkov, not bonks ready, not if Lashenko is part of this, not anybody to come in the future. Konechny a leading veteran and he's 31 years old. And that's, that's where you're at with that. All contending teams have players who are in their early thirties too, who are relied on in some capacity. He just can't be the, he can't be the end all be all of your rebuild, you know, and be the best player on the team still, you know, it's, it's kind of like, yeah. it was funny. Cause I know that over the past week, the or past couple of weeks, the MLB all-star game just happened. And, and the MLB all-star game is a lot like the NHL all-star game. Every team's got a representative, right? You don't want to just, you know, you want to be the throw in all-star on the team that, doesn't really have an all-star right like you don't want to consistently be that guy that's oh i'm the best player on a team that doesn't really have a lot of great players you want to have like that competition where you pick two three four guys that should be there every year and that's what they should be setting their sights on can connect me be one of those players for this future re you know the end of the rebuild yeah i think he still can be part of it but right now he's the best player on the team and I don't think you can throw as much into him right now as you would need to. And, and that's, that's an interesting part of it because when you push everything down the line, when you still come out of this off season with no clear cut answer at who your number one center is not really a clear cut answer on who your number one defenseman is. And let's be honest, not really a clear cut answer on who your true starting goaltender is either. You still got that question now lingering over your head. You have a lot of questions to answer before you can kind of dive in on this thing. If if we were talking about Travis Konechny and, and his contract and there's two, three years left on it and whether or not you're going to 
see him as part of the future when that's up different story it's the fact that there's such a timeline for this he's got one year left and this is the window is now open for extension or you're going to run out of time to do something with him because it's going to turn into a rental deal if he doesn't have another contract lined up in one way or another like that's where you saw a lot of ideas of maybe sign and trade him then like give him the you know see if you can't work out something with another team where he gets the contract he might want or close to and another team's willing to take it because and, and give you something in return or whatever but They've said all along they want to keep him. It's interesting that, you know, I kind of had thoughts at the beginning of this that it would be done already at this point because it sounded like that was the way they were going to go with it. But it's interesting because when he sticks, if he's sticking to that number, if he's sticking to close to double digits, then I bid you good luck on finding it because he, I, I was looking this up the other day and it's funny how, it's funny how close he is in comparison to Sam Reinhart in terms of, Reinhardt's contract year was this past year. Now we all saw what contract Sam Reinhardt got. He got the eight and a half million dollar deal, uh, eight years. Had 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 his best year yet. Did it in the right time. I almost wonder if that's what Konechny's going to need to do to get paid anywhere close to that if he really wants it. Because up until you know, this is Konechny's contract year now, right? And to this point in Konechny's career, just like with Reinhardt last year, going into his contract year. Reinhardt had had a career high of 33 goals. That's Konechny's career high. And Reinhardt had topped 80 points one time. Konechny has not, but mostly all of Reinhardt's other seasons were about the same point range as Konechny's had. So there was nothing impressive to say this guy's an $8 million player. There was nothing to indicate that realistically. And Reinhardt went out and had a year that made you change your mind about it because it wasn't just get to the 30 goal mark and maybe be a point per game player. He obliterated that. And then was on a team that was ready to win also. So you have a wide open window. That's the key differences. But it's interesting to me that that's all Reinhardt got. Because if that's what Reinhardt got, I think that changed the whole landscape of, of what Konechny's possibly looking for. Because it's it's going to be hard to match that when this is a player who gave you everything you could possibly get from the regular season performance, shattering career high numbers, great playoff performer. They win a Stanley Cup. And the contract signed, and he makes eight and a half million dollars. That had to terrify Konechny and his agent because it's it's if that's the indication of the market for a player who just topped fifty goals for the first time in his career and was on the team that won the Stanley Cup, it's going to be tough to get that from a lot of teams when you don't have that to back it up. So it's going to be interesting to see what they do with this going forward because it's really it's really the one decision that kind of dictates whether or not this is a quick you know they think this is a quicker rebuild or if it's something that's on the long-term side. And it's tough to tell which direction they're going right now because of all the buildup of picks in 25. Gotcha. Chef. I'm going to ask everybody in this, in this panel right now, I guess everything hinges on when you think the rebuild is ready. So are we looking at three years or five years? Realistically speaking, what are we? I, I think because Mitch Goff is here, they pushed it up to three years. And I think, if that is the case, then getting a deal with Travis Konechny is kind of paramount, don't you think? If not, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll yield to you guys. To, uh, I would love to hear Dan's opinion on this first because I'm very curious if, if he's a three-year rebuild or a five-year rebuild because Kevin's already pointed out that half this fan base is salivating now, more than probably half, that Mitch Gulf is here and, hey, let's speed this up here. So, Dan, what – how many year of rebuild do you think this is? Well, let me ask you this, Chef. When are we going to have a franchise center? That's why I'm asking. Yeah, I understand <laughs> that. So, Jet, Le you know, Jet Lachenko. Yeah, Jet Lachenko. So, <laughs> I mean, the, the reason that I'm sort of in the trade Travis Konechny camp is that I just don't see the depth of the prospect pool or even young centers that leads me to believe that this team can compete for a cup in three years on the current trajectory. Like you look at a team like Montreal, like they have Ivan Demidov, who they got this year, who is maybe close to as good a prospect as Mitchkov, but they have a ton of talent elsewhere. They had the number one pick the year before and they got Yuri Slavkovsky, who it looks like he's a budding star. They've got Cole Caulfield. They've got Nick Suzuki. They've got um, 
Jacob Fowler, who's one of the best young goalie prospects in the league. They've got um, Lane Hudson, who's one of the up and coming offensive defenseman prospects in the league. Like you look at the Devils, like they're already sort of ahead of us from a on the ice standpoint. They've got Jack Hughes and Nico Heischer who are pretty young. They've got a probably a better prospect pool than us. And they they added because they had a higher pick than us this year. Like I'm super excited about Mitchkov. I can't wait for this year to watch him, but I still don't see the path to a Stanley Cup right now for this franchise based on the current slate of players and the, you know, the current group of prospects. And you know, they really need their next year's draft right now looks like there's three or four guys who could be number one centers. Like it, it looks like as good as this year was for defensemen, that's how good next year's draft looks for centers. So for me, it's like, okay, how do we get, how do we have a get to a chance where we can get James Hagens or the, the Swedish center that everyone's talking about um, or, um, Roger McQueen, who's another good young center. Like, there's going to be these prospects, but if we finish 12th worst again, like, I just don't see the path. And and maybe it they think that next summer they can get Leon Dreisaitl in free agency, or maybe they think that the summer after that they can get Connor McDavid in free agency. Like, maybe they have these plans because there's a lot of money that's going to be coming off the books in the next few years to go after one of these big centers. But I'll tell you what. If they sign Travis Konechny, who's going to be a second line right winger on this team to eight and a half for a nine million dollar deal, well, then maybe you can't go out and sign a Leon Draisaitl or a Connor McDavid. So I just don't see the path to the cup for this team in three years unless they find a way to get one of those centers. Because Couturier, I mean, I'm worried about him, period. He, he had the back surgery this offseason. He had the abdominal surgery. No one seems to be talking about that. Like, I'm really worried about him. There's no center depth on this team at all. What is the path to a Stanley Cup for this team without any good centers? Like, I just don't – I don't see it right now. So, I don't know. No, I, I, totally, I totally agree with you. I was just wondering. I, I was taking the position of if, if, if the people think that Mitch Koff is here now and they think it's a three-year build, then I guess you have to make your move either way. But no, I, I'm thinking this is more of a four or a five as well. But go ahead. I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. No, no, no. I just I think it's at this point, I maybe it's a three year rebuild. They're gonna have to find some way to get some centers. Mitch Cobb's only nineteen years old. I'm not that concerned that like we have to win a cup by the time he's twenty two or twenty three. I mean, look at Nikita Kucherov. He's probably what, twenty eight, twenty nine, and he had one of the greatest offensive seasons in the history of the NHL this season. So I think Mitch Gobb is going to be very good for a long period of time, but I think hamstringing ourselves by signing Konechny to an eight-year deal when he may only be as good as he is right now for three years, I'm not sure that's the smartest thing to do. One of the problems with trying to trade Konechny, though, is that the teams that are going to want him are not the kind of teams that are going to have the types of draft picks or prospects that you're going to want to get. So it's kind of a hard guy to try and trade unless you can like trade him to a contender that has too many centers and you think they'll trade you one of their centers for uh you know ottawa wants to trade you shane pinto and something for travis connect like okay maybe you look at something like that but you know buffalo i don't know but um yeah i, I would i would be looking to move him at this point but i think at this point i think the hold up is that he's still asking for nine to ten million i don't think they're going to give him that much I think they'll end up signing a deal with him for like 8.25 million or something like that is sort of my guess. I think the option with Konechny is the, the, the altering the term and bringing that down and paying him more per year. To me, that would make more sense. If they're going to have more cap room and they want this player and they give him an extra million and million and a half for a five-year deal or something, I don't know if they'll go for it. But that would make more sense to me. Beyond that, I think they're better off, like Dan said, they're better off trading them. I don't know what they can get, but unless they start really taking a look and addressing the center position, then I don't know, like, I don't know what they're doing. 
And this is why I want to collect as many number two type centers as possible, because sometimes it, those guys break out and are better. And Lachenko, to me, if he's a number two, that's a little fortuitous based on what I've heard and what I've read. So it's probably more likely to be a third line center. So I don't know. He's a young player. You give him a chance. Again, I'm worried about those puck skills. Guys like that, you generally don't move up to that level, but we'll have to see. And then, of course, Kevin, there's the biggest question that the team this year has, and that's what's going to happen between the pipes. <laughs> I mean, we one of the big turning points in the season was the loss of Carter Hart, and, and the other one, of course, losing that that pair, that defensive pair with Nick Sealer and um, Sean Walker. Sure, yeah. So, I, you know, that those are the two big moments where – you know, they really couldn't handle that making that that change of the guard. And it was the right thing to do at the time. But Kevin, like, what do you look for with the goaltending tandem that they have right now uh, going into it and with uh, Ursan and uh, Fedotov? I mean, Fedotov is going to be the interesting one to me because there, there's really nothing we can go off of with him. You know, making appearances in three games isn't going to give me a whole lot of information on whether or not he can play at this level. So it's, it's like an extended trial run still when he comes in preseason and otherwise it's like, it's like a completely clean slate. It's like, it's like, as if we don't have much information, you know, we don't have much information on him to begin with. And we're going to be still gathering information on whether or not it feels like he can play at this level. I'm just curious, you know, like, like I, I think Sam Harrison's a, what I would like, I would call him a capable starter. And that's, that's not like meant to be like, elite by any stretch that's just there are teams that look for goaltenders and i think sam harrison would be a viable starter on a lot of teams simple as that like you can get by with sam harrison and win a decent number of games he has the ability to maybe steal you one on occasion but for the most part he's kind of just you know he looked more and more as he got used more and more like just kind of another average goaltender that's what the numbers said that's what some of the performances down the stretch said and as much as he handles, you know, handled the kind of adversity that was around him in terms of, you know, the net suddenly becomes yours. You're the number one starter. And then, oh, by the way, in addition to the number one starter, you're starting at a clip that we haven't seen since Marty Brodor was in net for the Devils, right? Like nobody starts whatever it was, 30 games in 41 or something like that. Or if, if it was even that, it was less than that. I think he'd only gone, you know, the last half of the year. I think he didn't start something like six or seven games. That was it. So. You look at that, and I just wonder if that, if there's more of a balance for him, if that works in his favor and makes him more capable than we think of being the starter. But to me, that's one of the positions that dictates whether or not they finish mid pack or if they finish at least top 10, you know, in terms of possibly with what they would get with their own first round pick, because I have no clue what to expect from Fedotov. And you got to expect that he's going to start a good chunk of those back-to-backs probably because they're, they're not going to be able to run Harrison into the ground like they did at the end of last season. And I think they know that. And because they can start the year like that and everybody's had the summer to prepare for this, I think the mindset goes like, I, I think that they totally didn't know what to do when it was Harrison's net after Carter Hart was gone. And nobody seemed to jump in and take the reins on a backup position when Cal Peterson's not getting it done and Felix Sandstrom's not getting it done. And you literally have to throw in the guy who just practically just got off the plane from Russia, you know, in, in to start a game that has major playoff implications kind of tells you how they handled the backup situation. So at least they can go in with that kind of being solidified a little bit that they have two guys that they know what they're going to do with them. It's just a matter of how regularly they lean on, Harrison to do something but I'm just curious as to what kind of performances we get because you know it, it, it technically was still Harrison's rookie year and you have to wonder whether or not you know as as he got more exposure does that mean there's a more of a book out on him what his weaknesses are what teams can take advantage of that's going to determine a lot of you know I think they I think they won a lot of games last year whether it was the first half of the year because Carter Hart was playing pretty decently and then Harrison would come in and kind of be the secret weapon that they had to be able to play as the backup. And then he kept that going for a little bit as it went into February. And then, you know, everything kind of took a dive when it was Harrison or bust in goal. That's where I'm curious as to how that performance goes and whether or not that 
dictates some wins and losses because let's face it, when they played the backups down the stretch, it did di dictate wins and losses down the stretch of the season. They had games where the goaltender couldn't stop anything and you lost games because of it. And then Arison was burnt out as well. So you have to factor that in and wonder if that's going to have any carryover, maybe not even at the start of a season, but in terms of durability for the entire year. And what happens if somebody gets hurt too? That's another factor that comes into play. Yeah. Kev, I mean, there is a lot of uncertainty because, you know, if there was a drop in performance, if there was a concern with the big club, this is a year that Alexei Kolosov was supposed to come over. Uh, I don't, we can talk about how he was handled last year when he came over. I think there's some legitimate criticism, but it seems like it's kind of dicey and they're not really sure if he's going to make it over. And he was really their number one prospect. Now that, you know, you could say that, that Ursan has graduated from that particular uh, status. Yeah, it's and it's concerning because that's obviously what you lean on right now. I mean, mate, look, they drafted two goalies the year prior, you know, in 23. Maybe that, you know, that can solve some of those problems later, but it doesn't help you immediately. This was the guy who was supposed to be basically third string, right? Like primary starter in the AHL and then ready to go if, if needed at a moment's notice, or maybe even not, you know, maybe the third string guy at the NHL level was still Cal Peterson so that you kept leaning on Kolosov at the AHL level for an entire year. just own the net at the AHL level, you know, for whatever reason that, you know, this is, you know, is going, is continuing to be a topic, you know, that he's homesick or whatever the case may be and that he missed a flight and all that stuff. And, you know, I've, I know I've, I've seen all the stuff that's out there about him and things like that. Uh, the one thing I'll stand by is Danny Briere is right about it. Like he's under contract. He's not supposed to be able to play anywhere else anyway. So it would lead to kind of a big, logistics nightmare in terms of what they would have to do to let him play anywhere else if he didn't want to play here. So that's the one thing I think the Flyers can hang their hat on is that they do have an active contract. It's very much the, it, you know, it's it's kind of the same thing that they tried to use with Fedotov, right? Like he can't go back to Russia per se because he's got a contract and the KHL looked at that and said, well, we don't care, right? Like it's a little different now. It's not the, it's not the other way around where he's got any other existing contract and somebody can say, we don't care. The, the flyers are the ones who are saying like, we don't care whatever he, you know, kind of to an extent, we don't care what he wants to do. He's supposed to play here. And we're, you know, that's probably why they're pushing the not concerned thing. It is a concern though, right? Like it's concerned because it's, it's a concern in light of cutter Gautier because it's another example of someone who's not here right now that should be probably, you know, if you were going to make him, like I said, if he's supposed to own the net in the AHL and I, I fully think he should, then you know, if he's not here, what does that mean for your future there also? I mean, you can only go so long before, you know, without a solution right there, right? Like, you're still waiting on, you know, Carson Bjarnason. He's going to play juniors again. And you got Zavrigan in Russia. You know, it's – there's still a waiting game with this. And you kind of felt like you had one of these top prospects waiting in the wings. That was the exciting part, right? Like that Kolosov was supposed to be waiting in the wings. And now that doesn't appear to be the case at the moment. It, it does create some some scrutiny there for sure. And to be honest, I was also that made me a little surprised when the draft rolled around this year and they didn't take a goalie. Usually, I mean, they've they took two the year before and I didn't, you know, at the time, who would have thought that they had a need for two goalies in the pipeline? Now, that sure looks like a better decision now that you don't know what's going on with Kolosov and Carter Hart's no longer a member of the organization either, right? Like you had two, two potentially two go out of the whole picture, you know, and maybe had three you guess three had three come in because if you want to include Fedotov, who many of us thought was never going to see the ice in North America, that's, you know, I guess, but it's, it's an interesting situation. And, and, and I think that the, the comparison here with Gautier is that it's another guy who's, like I said, it's a guy who's on the cusp, right? Like he was supposed to play at the AHL level. Now, whether he needed a year, full year there, two years there, whatever the case may be, he would have been right there and, and waiting in the wings for you. And that's what everybody kind of thought about Gautier last year until the trade happened, right? That that was, that was going to be the pairing move there, you know, and kind of ties into our previous topic too, right? About center depth that like, if you had a guy who was right there also waiting in the wings then you're excited about this, because there's, there's one of your centers, there's a, you know, a big winger coming in now with Mishkov, you might have a, a top goalie prospect waiting in the wings. You got a lot of things on your plate that are in your favor there. And it just doesn't feel like as much as in your favor because all this is happening. And it's a lot of, it's a lot of noise 
off to the side of this whole picture, especially when you're, you know, when everybody is so heavily focused on prospects and, and on the future. It's not it's not great news to hear that a 21 year old doesn't want to be around in North America anymore. That's not good news at all. Yeah. Uh, Chef. So other stuff that's like, whether you believe it or not, good news uh, during the presser. Rare said, uh, I think at least three times, I, I noted that, that he can't wait for uh, Mitch Koff to work with Torts. Now, <laughs> a lot of fan base and a lot of people think that he's a lame duck coach and along those lines. So, I mean, I guess, I mean, that was something that popped up. And he also said that, you know, uh, Danny said at least uh, two times he dropped, he would, uh, he would have been higher pick in the draft. So I know the expectations in the in, in in the organization are higher as well as with the fan base. But this whole thing about torts, and I, I know Dan has brought it up on several occasions. Uh, so Kevin, I'll ask you: uh, Should should Flyers fans who who are saying this be so concerned about having Tortorella around Mitch Ball? I mean, I understand where the concerns come from because let's put it this way: if it comes to this, there's no way to know until he actually starts working around torts and plays and we see how he adapts and what he does and all that type of stuff like that. But the first time he makes a critical mistake and gets sat on the bench, whether it's during the third period of a game or for an entire game as a healthy scratch, we already like, I know the fan base's reaction. I know what's coming when that news comes out. If, 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 and when it happens, right? Because it, it would go, it would go against what everybody wants to see at this point. Like you just want to see this kid play. That's the whole that's kind of the whole point, right? Like, especially if you if you already know, and and it's 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 something that I tie back to both the money comments that were made in the off season about the dead money that's going to come off the books in the next year or two, and about the just about like kind of almost preparing people for it. It it's probably not going to be a step forward next year. Like in terms of you were on the cusp of the playoffs, making the playoffs next year is not necessarily what we think is going to happen. And Briere kind of constantly said that about how like, it, you know, it might not be the same thing or whatever. And, and I agree with that because for one, I think you had a lot of overachievement. If you think like, listen, more power to you. If you think this is going to happen. And if these guys do this more power to them for stepping up into the situation. But if you think you're getting exactly the same thing this year, as you did last year, from Ryan Paling or from Garnet Hathaway or from guys like that who had really solid years. I'm just not expecting it like that. I'm not expecting kind of these upstart performances that you got from players, whether it was how good they were shorthanded, whether it was just the ability for guys like Paling and Hathaway to just step in and play, suddenly be second liners for a night and make it work. Like you had a lot of things that just worked out in your favor a lot. And I think other teams got better around you and, that's going to change some things. On the other hand, you know, maybe that's okay. Like, and and in that case, I think that's a good thing for Mishkov. Cause like, like I know we, we brought up earlier, whether or not, you know, maybe, you know, if, if Mishkov doesn't, you know, talks all this, talked all this talk today about winning and they don't win a lot next year. What's his mindset? Like when that happens, I don't think it's going to be a problem. He played in the KHL on loan for a team that wasn't very good. And, you know, as much as he had his sights set on the NHL, I think I think he's got to have some sort of understanding that there's a long goal to this and not next year or bust. Right. Like it may not go great. Focus on your individual development. Do you know, do whatever is asked of you and and showcase your own stuff in the process as well. And keep trying to get better and, and see how, you know, like, look, one of the things we also talked about already is in terms of Mishkov's presence. What does that do for other players, too? You know, if he can bring an, an added element of skill. And he can improve the game of certain players around him if he plays, you know, with, depending on who he plays alongside or in general, like you might put him out there with guys who we don't necessarily speculate for five on five play. Oh, what, who are his line mates on a regular basis? What about what power play he's on and who else is on that power play unit with him? You know, that's where you might see some combinations that don't have as much, you know, I guess have as much logic behind them in terms of, Oh, you know, this guy's a four checking forward. This guy's a good defensive forward. Here's, here's the playmaker, like trying to balance out those skills. It's all about playmaking on the power play. You want to just move the puck as effectively as possible and set somebody up to score a goal. So you're just taking, you should be just taking the five best guys you have to do that. And that should be a spot where he lets his skill shine a little bit. 
if he can just do some of those things and, and bear with it, I don't think he's going to have a problem with that at all. It just comes down to him making that adjustment and and seeing what he can and seeing what his skill set can do. And and I think as long as he does or, or at least shows the intent to learn the side of the game that Danny Breer talked about a lot in terms of if he learns how to play some defensive, you know, somewhat on the defensive side, I don't look, no one's asking him to be a Selkie winner right now or anything like that or, or ever for that matter. His, his bread and butter is go out and be a skill player. But if he can add the defensive element, I think like Briere said, it, it makes for a longer and better career. If you're more well-rounded and there's, you know, there's plenty of players who come into the league touting offense and it's, it's their calling card right now. And they eventually evolve into that complete player and it doesn't take away from their offensive side, but it makes them a more well-rounded player. And I think that that's, if you got something like that, then I don't know how John Tortorella wouldn't be pleased with what he's getting. At the very least, it goes back to where we started with this with Mishkov, where his mindset, his attention to kind of, kind of, he has this understanding about what the situation is, it seems, what the situation is surrounding him that, as much as you, again, as much as you want to say he's not a savior, it sure feels like he is right now. All eyes are on him. I don't think he cares about that. I think he just wants to go and be the best version of himself. And if he's going to be the best version of himself and dedicate himself to it, I, I struggle to see how John Tortorella is going to have a problem with it. But you never know, right? Like, because it's just part of tor towards his track record, too. You know, the, the sitting down of guys, the, you know, the Morgan Frost line up and down like a toilet seat or things like that, right? Like, the, you, you, if you have that situation and it's too much, of the back and forth with him. It's an act that's going to get old to the fan base quick. And I want, I, I've, I've wondered how, how old that will get to everybody else in the organization too. Now that he's here, because I think it was one thing when you don't have that top prospect actively playing for you and you're still building something and you've got guys that definitely need a lot more attention to reach the ceiling. I, I think that Mishkov's got the, got, su got such an ability to maybe reach that ceiling and do it in pretty quick fashion with the with the skills that we've seen so far that if you're going to do that up and down with him I think it's going to get old quick so hopefully there's not much to talk about with that because he just embraces the style that Torts has and and understands the coaching style and you know like like we said with his KHL career he he had a lot of attention on him then too and he played for a KHL team that kind of messed messed with him in that sense too, where he wasn't always playing or he wasn't getting the most ice time and he kind of just took it and and un, and understood he had to wait for the for the right opportunity. And that might have set the stage for him coming here. So hopefully that's given him the fortitude to handle a coach like John Tortorella. Yeah, Dan, before I get to you, just just to emphasize a point you made about the defensive side of the puck, I think of a, a player like Vlad Tar Tarasenko was more attractive to a playoff team and ended up winning another cup because of his exposure and his willing to buy into what Berube did in St. Louis. And Berube, that wasn't this great offensive powerhouse. Everybody had to play a two-way game. And that probably helped him prolong his career because it, it, if he didn't feel like he could trust Tarasenko, Paul Maurice wasn't going to put him out there if, 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 there, if the shift was going to be a disaster. Uh, Dan, uh, you're next. Yeah, so I just talk about Mitch Cobb a little bit more and why I have just zero concerns about him and Tortorella is because, again, this kid eats, sleeps, breathes hockey. He got off the plane yesterday. He was on the plane for 22 hours. He immediately wanted to go out on the ice, shoot pucks. I mean, his work ethic is just unbelievable. He's a hockey machine. And I don't and, and he goes to the dirty areas, right, which is what I talked about earlier. Honestly, and I've been banging the drum that I think he could be as good or better than Connor Bedard is because I see their offensive skill sets on similar levels. I think that Bedard, you know, has got one of the best shots I've ever seen in my entire life. Some of the other things that Mitchkov does, I think, are at a little bit of a higher level than Bedard. And I think that he has kind of a more of a willingness to go to the dirty areas. So from that perspective, like I. I won't be surprised if he ends up having as good a career as Connor Bernard. I don't think there's going to be issues with John Tortorella and Mitch Cobb. I don't think he'll end up, I could look like an idiot here, but I don't think he's going to end up like scratching him for performance based reasons. Maybe, you know, he'll be get run down a little bit and he'll need a break here or there, but 
I just think that he's going to love the kid. And, and they're, they're so desperate. You heard Tortorella after all these games the last two years talk about how they need more skill. They need more skill. They need guys that can put the puck in the net. I think he's going to love having Mitch Gov here because he brings the skill. He also brings that enthusiasm. And you can see he also wants to be kind of like a, a leader out there too. Like he wants to be the guy. I just I don't see an issue with Tortorella and Mitchkov. Um, and so that's kind of like the, the, the way I, I see this playing out. I, I think I think they're going to really enjoy each other. And Tortorella is not an idiot. Like he, he knows why people are, are coming out. I mean, he knows that people aren't coming out to see Morgan Frost. He doesn't, you know, not concerned about scratching him. Um, I don't think he did he scratch connect me at all this year? I, I don't know. Um, not this year. I don't know. Not so. this year no. for performance based reasons. I guess maybe he has in the past, but um, yeah, I just, I, I, I don't, I don't see it being an issue with, with Tortorella. No. Hey, and let's talk about what, what the lineup's going to look like um, kind of as we, as we close down here and, and maybe put some line combos together. If anybody wants to, to run that, I'll, yeah, let me. Uh, sure. Yeah, just because I, I, I think you had a, yeah, you had a graph together. I, I tweeted out yesterday that, that I hope Morgan Frost is learning some Russian over the summer because <laughs> it doesn't see it doesn't seem to matter. Like Tortorella just doesn't seem like he's gonna become a Morgan Frost fan. Even when Frost went into his office and kind of had it out with him and Tortorella talked about how nice that was that he did that, he still scratched him again. Like you know, towards the end of the year, benched him a little bit. But Morgan Frost to me seems like the 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 most well suited forward on this team to try and match up with the hockey IQ that Mitchkov has. So like my kind of dream line is I would love to see Mitchkov with Frost and Forster on the left. I know some people have talked about they'd like to see Tippett on that line. Uh, I I think that Forster's defensive awareness would fit a little bit better with a guy like Mitchkov than Tippett. I think that if you put Tippett, Mitchkov, and Frost out there, uh, you might be in for some trouble from a defensive perspective. You might be in trouble anyway. But Frost really came on defensively last year, I thought. And Forster's really responsible defensively. So I really like those two guys with Mitchkov. So that's that's what I would be doing there. And the, look, the rest of it, I don't know, because the rest of it all depends on if Sean Couturier is healthy, right? If I, I – People are just assuming that Sean Couturier and Jamie Drysdale are going to be fine for the start of the season. Like they both had abdominal surgery, <laughs> uh, you know, color me a little bit skeptical about it. And Drysdale, obviously he's younger. He hasn't as, had as many issues, although he has a lot, but he, not as many issues as Couturier. So, okay, maybe he'll be fine for the start of the season. Couturier, I don't know if he's healthy, it's got to be like Couturier, Konechny and Tippett, right? Or, something like that if again assuming my other lines are correct and then something like you know paling Faraby, and brink and then delorier lawton and hathaway or, or, or something like that i mean i don't know i st it's still surprising to me they haven't made any moves because you're going to be in a situation where either cates or lawton or brink or delorier is going to have to sit i tell you this I don't think they're going to want to have Mitch Cobb out there a whole lot in games where Delorier is not in the game too. I'm almost looking forward to the first time that someone tries to go after Mitch Cobb because Delorier is going to be like a caged lion on the bench. Like, I mean, he, he, he knows where his bread is buttered this year, Delorier. That's for sure. Yeah, at well, least that, to, that to was start the season. At the press yeah. conference, right? That that got yeah. used Andrew to him. Said he showed him the showed, video and said it's going to be his best friend. Yeah. yeah. He have a video of Delorier fighting against the Rangers and said, this guy's going to be your best friend. So I think, you know, he's going to be his personal bodyguard, but, um, <laughs> but that would be what I would be looking at for lines. So. Yeah. I think Cates is going to actually get in there somehow um, with that. But yeah, you're right that way. It's like, he, he, I think, especially, like I said, it, earlier in the year, Delorier is going to be in that lineup and maybe, the play will dictate when Cates and Brink and uh, yeah, I think particularly Brink might be the guy who, who's the odd man out. So he just signed a, a new two year deal for uh, what was two years at 1.5 and Zamul is two years at 1.7. Speaking of the defense, uh, Kevin, do you think you're going to come back with the uh, York and Sanheim 
Steeler and Drysdale, and then it's kind of like pick and choose. I would think Zamula is going to start with Ristolainen, and if Ristolainen is healthy, with uh, Jinning, Adderd, and EJ, who's, who is signed back for uh, a million for one year. Yeah, I, I, I think that's probably the structure you're looking at. I think that they like the York Sandheim pairing. I think they've envisioned what Dry, what Drysdale can look like with Sealer. You know, the third pairing to me is going to be this mix and match game for a chunk of the, at least probably in the early part of the year. I think you've got it right with who probably starts on opening night. I'll give you that part, like that it's probably Zamula Ristolainen, but Johnson will rotate in because he's basically been signed to be the seven. He's basically signed in the Mark Stahl role. And, you know, I would look, I would give any of the other guys a, a shot to make the team or to sh- a shot to insert themselves into that third pairing. You're ginning, you know, guys like that. Obviously, you know, they at the beginning of last season, they gave Emil Andre a brief look and then sent him back down for what would be the remainder of the year. And he, he needed that probably, you know, he needed the time in the minors. Something that I found interesting about kind of those conversations, though, is, you know, Jinning is obviously got a new contract. He's back and he's part of the picture. And they've talked a ton about Hunter McDonald and they keep bringing up Emil Andre, too, as like some of the guys in the minors or who could get a good long look at camp. Let's just say that much. They don't really talk about Ronnie Adderd much, though, do they? You know, he's like the forgotten guy of this thing. And I don't necessarily think that should be the case. I mean, like to me, I don't, I don't have a player in that group that emerges as the clear cut best of those four. Like they're all up for like all up for a spot at training camp. That's, that's kind of the point of this, right? Like that should be a wide open competition right now. If you're going to look to see if anybody steps in over any of these other guys who are third pairing or lower, right? Like, I just find it interesting that they don't mention him much anymore because usually if you're not getting mentioned much, like it's pretty obvious if you're getting mentioned without prompting, that means they like you a lot. And if you're not getting mentioned at all, it kind of means you're an afterthought. So the number of times that I've heard Hunter McDonald's name or, you know, we know they like Andre, but it's been a little less lately because I think everybody saw he needed more development. But the number of times they've mentioned McDonald and not mentioned Andre at all or mentioned Adder at all means kind of means something to me. I think that that means that at this point, McDonald's past Adderd in terms of what they think. And that's really interesting for the competition of it and interesting for players futures too, because, you know, and I get, I get it. Adderd's at an age kind of like Jennings getting to an age too, where it's like, you got to make a decision on whether or not you think they're sticking in your NHL lineup or not. But I'd be looking at all options. And I would think that all of those options are on the table when the rest of your group involves guys like Ristolainen and Johnson, like, you know, you've got veterans in there too. At some point in time, you got to do what you've said you're doing all along and open the whole competition up, right? Like, it's not just we got to have these veteran guys in because Ristolainen makes five point one million dollars or something. You know what I mean? Like, and Tortorella wasn't afraid to pull various guys out of the, that lineup for whatever reason. Also, you know, he played Stall a lot, but he also took Stall out of the lineup. He took Johnson out of the lineup at occasion at the end of last year. And he definitely went back and forth with Ristolainen for a while too, you know, especially in that first year. So sometimes that doesn't matter. And it's, that's, you know, I would hope that that doesn't matter, that it's not just based off of veteran status or money that they make or anything like that. It's about who gives you the best chance to succeed and who's, and what's good for your future. Like what, what team you want to put on the ice, not just next season, but for years to come, you got to be figuring that stuff out. So uh, that's why as much, you know, I, as much as I like what I see sometimes when you look at those, maybe those top four and, you know, sealers part of it, obviously, and that's a veteran, but I want to see Cam York in that top pairing role again and see if there's anything that carries over. I liked his defensive play at the end of last year. And I thought that at times he was more confident as an offensive player too. You know, he had moments where he would jump up a little bit more and kind of showcase I think the player that, you know, kind of the player he was at Michigan, he would showcase that a little bit more. I, I want to see another. He's one of the first guys that comes to mind when you talk about taking another step from what you got last year or the year before. He mm-hmm. he comes to mind. Tippett comes to mind. Forrester comes to mind because these are guys that did do something to me that improved what their future potential could be. But yeah, and you feel like there might be another step, but you got to get there. Like I like Forrester is a great example of that for me because Forrester's 
he got to a nice round number last year, right? He got to that 20 goal mark and Joel Farabee did early in his career too. And then hasn't really been the same player ever since, right? Like it's almost like proceed with caution when something like that happens because Forster looks like a, a really nice player. looks like a guy who can continue to expand upon, you know, Hey, 20 goals as a rookie, keep going, keep taking steps in a positive direction there. You know, not to get off of the defenseman topic too much, but we did talk forwards as well. I love that first line, or, or at least that Mishkov combination. I love the idea of putting Forrester and Frost with them because Forrester to me is not only from, I guess, the defensive perspective that Dan brought up, but for me, his forechecking goes a long way in mm-hmm. that. he was a he, To me, he was one of the most impressive forecheckers on the team last year. And because of that, I think that he's going to be able to create a lot for Mishkov in a way because sometimes you're going to create just by – gaining possession by winning a battle in the offensive zone or creating a turnover or something like that. If Forster's got that in his game, I think that's huge for him and huge for Mishkov to be able to maybe get better scoring opportunities. And Frost was always advertised as, and and has shown it at in spurts and at different moments in his career to this point, just with not, it's kind of lacked the consistency. I think that's the biggest knock is he's got playmaking ability. He's got, some real good offensive talent. He can make plays and he can set up teammates and he can score some nice goals too. He just hasn't done it with consistency. And I wonder if having other players that complement that playmaking ability, because Mishkov's going to have that ability too. I wonder what that would do if that could unlock another level for him offensively, because I, I agree the defensive play came around a lot last year. He looked way more the part of kind of looked like, a really good two center, right? Number two center. He looked really good for that part. And I wonder if adding a player with Mishkov's talent will take some of that offense and push that just a little bit more towards the player that was getting a lot of hype in juniors. Now that he may have a teammate that can compliment him like that. And then the rest, the rest of that group is very much a grab bag, isn't it? Like it, it depends on who's your center, you know, in certain spots, if Couturier is going to play. I, and I, you know, I agree with Dan that it's not talked about enough. It's something I've kept in the back of my mind since, you know, kind of hearing about these off season surgeries and things like that. Like I, I know the word, you know, the word core muscle surgery to me gives me PTSD. You know, I heard that for Sean Couturier and I'm like, okay. And all I can think about is the years that Claude Giroux kept having to have that same kind of surgery. And you're not the same for the first half of the season coming back. Right. You know, I'm curious as to just how recovered he is. You know, maybe look, maybe it's, maybe it's different than it was, you know, seven, eight, nine years ago when somebody would get that surgery and the recovery is a little bit faster and there's a way to work through it a little bit better. But let's not act like Couturier hasn't been through a lot in his career already injury wise. I'm a little bit more hopeful on that with Drysdale because he's a younger guy. I'm hoping that maybe that allows him to heal up faster and 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 that that it was done early enough. But there's still concern. And that's another, you know, kind of kind of to go back to a topic that we discussed too, because we talked about the goaltending and kind of how that's a question mark area and things like that. And to me that, like I said, that's one of the areas that will determine how good of a team they are is how good their goaltending is. You know, I don't know what kind of year to expect from Drysdale. If he's still trying to kind of figure out how healthy he is at the start of this thing coming off of a surgery, you know, if he's trying to work his way through it and we haven't seen, you know, basically everything that was that, that we've been told because of that injury update is well, then you haven't seen, you still haven't seen what his best could be because he was playing through all that last year, even after the trade happened. Well, what if he's not playing at his best when this year starts either, because he's still not completely back from all of that. You know, it's, it, it's, you're in the crucial years of his development too. Let's not forget. So like, I'd want to see him at full health and I'd want to see if he can be full go. And, and I, I like, that's the thing too. Like that's a big concern because of the fact that, if he was banged up at the end of the year and we knew he was dealing with some injuries because he missed time right before the end of the season. Anyway, it's just, you wanted to see maybe what would happen if he had the off season to let those bumps and bruises heal, come back, have an off season of training, go through a John Tortorella training camp and then start the season. What kind of player were we going to get? It's a little compromised. If he's not completely there for health wise, because of this surgery, that's a little compromised at that point to me. And that's, going to make it hard to determine what kind of player you've got right away because you're still trying to figure out if he's healthy enough. And that's a big question. And and let's, let's not forget with, with Drysdale, there's, there's a lot at stake because of what you gave up because of what the circumstances were for you getting him right. Like it would be one thing if you had that player and 
on top of it had some other defensive prospects that you were hyping up equally as much and had Cutter Gauthier and Matt Vey Mishkov. And it's like, okay, look at this core we're building and, and things like that. He's he's your number one guy on the on the blue line right now in terms of prospect because I kind of I kind of keep moving York out of that picture a little bit because York's had enough NHL experience now that I think he's not as much of a prospect. You're just trying to see what the ceiling at the NHL level is, but he's an he's a regular there now. It's you know it's more about seeing what Drysdale brings and what he can give you at that level. So I'm hoping for you know that he's at full health because it's going to make it a lot easier to determine whether or not his skill set and his ceiling is high enough to kind of warrant what was talked about when they acquired him. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's all I got. Anybody have any more questions uh, for Kevin before we we call uh, a wrap to his segment? No, I'm good. Good. Well, Kev, I I think we covered a lot of ground tonight. I I really appreciate you, you coming on. Um, any final thoughts from you and uh, where could people find your work? Yeah. So as always, 97.3 ESPN.com had a couple things up on the Mishkov news over the last 24 hours. So you can go give it a look and most, mostly, you know, the most recent one is all kind of based on the press conference and things like that, but did also kind of just give my thoughts on his arrival and kind of what it means for the, the new era as, as they've continued to call it. Um, so it's over there, sports talk, Philly.com. Uh, YWT podcast, all sorts of, you know, everything like that on Twitter at, or Twitter X still not used to that at Kevin <laughs> underscore or so. Um, and yeah, I mean, not, you know, like I said, thanks for having me on guys. Always nice to talk to you guys. Always nice to talk about hockey in the depths of July, you know, and, and to have relatively recent news in the depths of July. Normally this doesn't happen. I'm normally like kicked back waiting for the end of August by this point. So it was nice to have a little something to actually talk about in addition to just the usual off-season fodder, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, our timing was very good tonight, that's for sure. <laughs> absolutely. Kev, yeah, thanks so much for coming morning. aboard, man. Thanks, absolutely, Jeff. guys. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care, man. You got it. All right. So, gents, I guess that the only other thing going on right now, and it's really more for people who are really into the prospects, is the World Junior Summer Showcase where eight flyer prospects are going to be there of varying levels. Uh, Jack Berglund, a second round pick this year, Heike Ruonen, and a, a fourth round pick also this year to join uh, Denver Barkey. Carson Bjornesson, Oliver Bonk, Jet Lachenko this year's first round draft pick. Carter Southern, I think it was a fifth round or a fourth or a fifth rounder from last year, a defenseman. And Noel Powell, I think it was a fifth round pick this year, who's intriguing because he plays a very mature game. So I think there's a package you can go online. It's if you really want to see how these kids, if you if you've been following real close, you might see some improvement from uh, the guys that you saw last year, and you might be surprised by the performance of the new guys that are coming in, Berglin, Ruonin, and uh, obviously the most important one, Jet Lichenko. So that's important to know. Chef, what's your final word, brother? Final word is, you know what? I, I want to sneak in something because I didn't get that yeah, comment sure. on the line mates with Mitch Paul. I, 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 I kind of I kind of think that don't be surprised if Noah Cates plays some kind of role in there. I don't know why. It's just a feeling because I, I know Torch likes the way he plays, and he's a younger guy too. So, But anyway, but my final word is it, it's almost here. We're like, what, 60 gay days away from like either a camp and or a playoff or not playoffs, uh, preseason, and then 79 for NHL. So it can't come fast enough. So, hey, you want to argue with us about it? You can catch me on – on X at Chef to Left B on X. You got it, Dan. You know, it's just, it's, I can't wait to be at that opening game and just feel the energy. It's been a long time since we've had something to really be excited about. So despite the fact that I'm still not that, I still have some questions about the future of this franchise. Uh, just having a guy like Mitch Cobb is just so excited. I think it's going to carry us through kind of a lot of, bad times so uh or times that could have been bad i think it's going to be great having a kid like this i think he's going to exceed expectations 
I'm very excited about him. And so, you know, for me, that's the excitement for the rest of the summer. Gotcha. Now, I don't blame you. The Fans can find me uh, at dsilver88 on Twitter. And, um, yeah, let's get, get ready for the season. You got it. Before we go, just got to remind you about Jim South Street, 400 South Street in Philadelphia, 40 years of the finest cheesesteaks and hoagies in the grandest Philadelphia tradition. You know you want one. Cheesesteaks, hoagies, fries. No, I ate it you know, about a few hours ago. I could go for one right now, but I'm in Florida. So if you're in the Philadelphia area, especially if you're down there at 400 South Street, you get DoorDash, Uber Eats, whatever it takes to get that food to your door. Jim South Street, 400 South Street in Philadelphia, PA. And with that, just a reminder that the OMP podcast is on multiple podcast platforms, including Apple, iHeart, Spotify, TuneIn, Amazon Audible, Deezer. We have a YouTube page. Make sure you hit that subscribe and like button. And also, we have a Facebook page as well. And for YouTube, just a reminder, you just plug in there, OMB Podcast. And if you would be kind enough to rate and subscribe, we got a five-star rating a few shows ago that we read. We really do appreciate it because all of this helps move us up the charts when people are looking for Philadelphia Flyer Podcast. And we really do appreciate that. So that's it for tonight. Thanks for listening. And until next time, everybody, take care.